Welcome to this presentation on the epistemologies of Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas. My name is Brother Lawrence, and this presentation is part of a final project in a class on logic and epistemology at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Now, the epistemology of Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas, it's quite a broad topic, so we'll just be scratching the surface, but I think it, it's a particularly interesting comparison, and part of that's because the two thinkers had so much in common. Not only are they both canonized saints and doctors of the Catholic Church, but more importantly, they were contemporaries of each other. They had a shared experience at the University of Paris in the mid 13th century, and that means that they inhabited a shared cultural environment. So let's look a little more closely at this historical and intellectual context that both Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas shared. An important part of that is the works of Aristotle. Now, there had always been access to some works of Aristotle in, in the west of Europe, where Latin was the language of education. But beginning some centuries before Bonaventure and Aquinas, all of a sudden there was access to works that had been lost. New translations came in from Arabic into Latin, and this was initially controversial. There was a question of how Aristotle's insights, which were, were persuasive, how they could be reconciled with certain elements of the Catholic faith. Now, by the time Bonaventure and Aquinas both come along and are reaching their prime, Aristotle's works have definitely been enthusiastically embraced in the universities, but they're still not without their detractors. So there's this outstanding question of how we can reconcile and integrate Aristotelian insights with the Catholic faith. Another important element is, is the scholastic method at this time. So an important part of the scholastic method was the attempt to reconcile what often appeared to be contradictory statements, quotations given by the church fathers, particularly in Peter Lombard's book of sentences. But the work is not so much to draw out distinctions and contrasts, but to find a cohesive and integrated interpretation of all the various texts that respects the different authorities and brings them into a cohesive whole. So speaking of church fathers, let's move on to one of those giants of the medieval theology, and that's St. Augustine. We'll have to ask ourselves, what is Augustinian Illuminationism? Because both Augustine and Aristotle are key for both Aquinas and Bonaventure. And from the outset, we need to realize that many modern thinkers believe Augustine and Aristotle present mutually contradictory epistemologies. Here in one summary, a thinker describes August Augustinian illumination, saying it's widely understood as that Platonic account of knowledge that holds that absolutely certain necessary truth is obtained not via the senses, which are mutable and thus incapable of delivering certainty, but via awareness of the eternality of the divine ideas in the mind of God. So these eternal reasons would be distinct from Plato's forms, but clearly influenced by it. And if we read Augustine talking about these divine reasons as a sort of surface level change to accommodate Platonism to Christianity, then it would indeed be difficult to reconcile what he says with Aristotle's understanding of how we come to know objects. Before moving on to Aquinas, and I'll, I'll present Aristotle's thought in the context of Aquinas, but I think this does relate to something that Gallagher said in our textbook. At one point, he too talked about how it, it's only possible to know a thing through or th and through or absolutely if we create it. So given a certain definition of es essence, only creative knowledge can know the essence of things. So moving on to St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, before going into his epistemology, I'll note that one distinction is that he writes more works on specifically philosophical subjects. He has commentaries on the works of Aristotle, and he addresses epistemology um, quite in depth in the context of his Summa, which aims to be both pedagogical and systematic. So according to Thomas Aquinas, how do we come to know an object? Now, first principles are a bit distinct. They have to do with, with potency, with potentiality of the mind toward, toward those ideas already. But focusing in on, on other ideas, on knowing an object, there's this process of mysterious intuition by which the human intellect reads into the nature of some given material object. So that, that mysterious intuition has two phases. The first phase is something we have in common with other animals, that we perceive things through our senses and our imagination. 
I can imagine that I see a, or let's propose that I see a poodle in front of me. I can see the hair, the, the teeth, the four legs, the wagging tail, etc. Then phase two, we have this process of abstraction, and this is unique to human beings. So after having seen a poodle, I may see a German shepherd, I may see a beagle, and then there will be this process of abstraction that happens. And this process has to do with something called the agent intellect, which is something that Aquinas takes from Aristotle. So the agent intellect itself has two parts. We have an active and a passive intellect at work. And so in that, that process of abstracting, the active intellect is working. That's when I see, I've seen the poodle, the German shepherd, the beagle, and all of a sudden there's this flash and, and before my mind, I have this image that was not there before of the universal idea of a dog. And then the passive intellect includes activities such as ju judging and reasoning. I, I can do things with that that I've received, but the active intellect involves that flash there. And it's important for both Aquinas and Bonaventure that a metaphor of light is often used. Um, I have been noted in one Dominican summarizing Aquinas's work, he says, speaking of that active intellect, that as if by the turning of some electrical switch, a flood of intellectual light, if we may use the metaphor, flashes upon it, upon the complex of sensible qualities, that is the phantasm, it assumes an intelligible, immaterial condition. So that will be important that, that there's this, this process where all of a sudden something that was not there is there, and we have a metaphor of light for it. So that's going to be our segue into the thought of Bonaventure. But before that, let's turn and see what we can summarize of the work of the epistemology of Thomas Aquinas. Well, one, do we truly know objects? Yes. So when we, when we see that sensible individual, I, I see a dog, for example, the idea is contained in that sensible individual as a letter in its envelope. So I really know what it, what it means to be a dog. Um, it's there and it's reproduced in my passive intellect as the likeness of a person in a looking glass or on some photographic plate. But there's also this idea that this idea, it participates in some way in God's ideas. And I'll read this this quote in full. Now, if the substantial form is capable of being so ideally reproduced, it is because it is itself an idea, a concept of the divine mind embodied in matter, the archetype of which exists in God and which has been enclosed in it by him. Hence, it follows that the cognitive process is nothing other than a communion with the divine mind through the intermediary of things, a deciphering of the book that he has written in nature for our instruction. For the whole universe is the handiwork of God, and the heavens declare his glory. So we can see that those ideas, at least when I have this intelligible idea of dog, it's at least a participation in the idea as it exists in the divine mind. The archetype exists in God, but I'm, I'm, I'm somehow participating in that, and that is a way in which I'm drawn into a communion with God. Moving on to St. Bonaventure. Now, we talked about how Aris, uh, Aquinas has his commentaries on Aristotle. He addresses um, epistemology quite clearly in the Summa. Now, for Bonaventure, it's perhaps characteristic that many people looking for his epistemology look at for it in a work on the knowledge of Christ. Some scholars have gone so far as to say that Bonaventure has no philosophy properly so called, if by that we mean rational speculation apart from divine revelation. So what does Bonaventure tell us about human knowledge? Our first point would be this contuitio, this idea that our intellect truly knows objects even it could, as it can simultaneously know them in the divine mind. So having created the universe, Christ is a sign which points back to its divine origin with a radiant intelligibility which mirrors his own blinding intelligibility the word grants the human intellect a share in his own light, the agent intellect, by which man is able to discern in each thing the essence that shadows God by abstracting and adequating it to the human intellect's own nature. So at the same time, together with that, he constantly shines down his own light, the light of the immutable ideas upon the human intellect, 
so that the intellect can perceive the immutable truth of a thing, the divine light and the human light cooperate to produce the contuited knowledge, which is appropriate to the human soul as being created in the image of God. So we have both of those at the same time. This process of abstraction is, is truly there, and, and it's always there, even in the case of Jesus and the hypostatic union. The intellect retains its own activity, yet there's also this receiving of, of divine light from God to see the divine ideas, the divine reasons as they exist in God, at least when there's certain knowledge. So another key part about Bonaventure's epistemology is this distinction between wisdom and knowledge. Now in the Augustinian tradition, wisdom is the usual name for perfect knowledge or absolute knowledge. And ordinary knowledge knows in the divine light, but wisdom beholds the divine light itself. Con continuing to speak about wisdom then, there's a connection between wisdom and holiness. For Bonaventure, access to uncreated wisdom is situated along a sliding scale governed by the degree of intimacy in a soul's union with God, which in turn dictates how great a gift of created wisdom the soul receives. So in receiving this wisdom, which is, is a grace, there's a, a normal way that God works in people, and that's through our ancient intellect. There's a, a general influence by which God acts, but then there's also the special influence of, of by means of grace where we can receive the created wisdom given to us and that can be hindered by both sin and by the fact that we live in, in statu vie we live under the current conditions of this human life so there are exceptions though <laughs> there's this possibility of being moved and raptured and lifted up by an excess of knowledge that we we seem unable to receive fully in this life but we're given a glimpse of it so what is the distinction between that and the beatific vision? The distinction would be that in the beatific vision, we'll arrive at that view becoming one. But here, we can arrive at this immediate unitary view of the supreme principle and the highest truth itself without becoming one with that truth. So still our vision, our the absoluteness of human knowledge is hindered ultimately by sin, but also by the conditions of this present life. But God's grace comes in and gives us glimpses, real participations in that true knowledge, that true wisdom, participation in the ideas as they exist in God. Now, what are some similarities then between the works of Bonaventure and Aquinas on epistemology? For one, they're both interested in reconciling Augustine and Aristotle. They both see them as authorities and they believe that, that the two accounts of knowledge can complement and correct each other. And in particular, they see how the Asian intellect from Aristotle can cooperate with the divine eternal reasons as laid out in Augustine. They're interested in demonstrating that Augustine's light of the eternal reasons is ripe for assimilation with Aristotle's description of the capacity of the ancient intellect to abstract unchanging truth from sensible species. Then what are some differences between the epistemologies of Bonaventure and Aquinas? Well, for one, they have different emphases. Aquinas is definitely focused on showing how these Augustinian eternal reasons can function as an immaterial cause of our knowledge of maternal, material things without violating and indeed supporting the Aristotelian epistemological givens. Bonaventure's focus is more on the fact on defending that when we do attain immutable truth regarding mutable things, we must somehow attain the eternal reasons themselves and not merely a created habit in our own minds. They come in with different questions as well. Um, Aquinas approaches the Augustinian text through issues relating to the cause of, of knowledge. How do we know something? Whereas Bonaventure approaches them through this focus on creator-creature creator, incommensurability. He's interested again in the person of Christ and what that means when you have creator, creator and creature coming together. But as, as, as this scholar Boring points out, their strategies of interpretation and their harmonizing agendas are similar, so much that Bonaventure's work in, in on the knowledge of Christ can be seen as a prototype for Aquinas' later formulation about 10 years later when he was writing the Summa. So another difference is the re exact relationship between our knowledge and those divine reasons. So for Bonaventure, there's definitely two things going on at the same time. 
the intellect attains the eternal ratio together with the created ratio in every act of certain knowledge. Whereas for Aquinas, knowing in the divine light simply means knowing through a created participation in the divine light, the light of our ancient intellect, which is the seal of the divine light in us. So there, there is a distinction there in that relationship between how we know and those divine reasons, although both make use of those divine reasons. So while each author approaches the topic of epistemology with their own distinctive emphases and concerns, both Bonaventure and Aquinas share a desire to reconcile Aristotelian epistemological principles with Augustine, and in fact they do so in remarkably similar ways, each within about a decade of each other. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope it was illuminating, at least in some respects.